I want to jump into this because our top story is going to take us to Hong Kong and it's going to take us with a true market expert here in studio and that's going to be Henry Byers who's going to be talking to what's really happening right now with imports and, and what's going on with Maritime. Henry, thanks so much for being with us in studio. Thanks for having me. We love, we love having, having you here, here because, as, as you know, you know I'm, I, 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 I like to talk about a little bit. bit. I, think I think you do, do too, a little, a little bit, bit as well. well. And, and kind, kind of what's going on with the discussion on LinkedIn, LinkedIn right, right now and really all over the web really talking about the current state of freight is that there's this import demand. Do we have a surplus? Are we sitting on too much inventory? Companies coming out and saying, we've got more stuff than we can handle or want. Talk to us about what's going on and kind of what the general response is. Sure, well, I mean, you know, before we, before we actually, you know, put the article out yesterday, uh, we had already written the article. The target, it was just confirmation, essentially. It was uh, very coincidental how that all, you know, happened at once. So their announcement about having too much inventory and announcing an aggressive inventory reduction plan uh, was really no surprise to us because because we were certainly seeing it in the data as far as import demand at origin. So we're looking at this, important to remember, two ways of looking at imports as they arrive and as they leave. We're looking at them as they leave you know, countries of origin. And this is, this is worldwide. This is not just China, not just Germany. This is worldwide. So very much a signal as to what's to come as far as import demand. And Henry, we're looking at import demand, of course, we have to think about what we just went through. Of course, there was a pandemic, there was a huge demand for certain types of goods. Now we're hearing stories of, I think, some executives trying to soften the blow a little bit, just mm -hmm. trying to make room for the right inventory or seasonal things. Any thoughts around that? Yeah, absolutely. It's a combination of factors. I mean, you and I have been talking about this for, for two years, it feels like, you know, from the stimulus and how that may impact inflation and the overall ordering of goods potentially. And then you also have the geopolitical risk. You have the pandemic is obviously one. So you have importers also mitigating against that type of risk by bringing in more freight, more goods. Um, and even the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine is also another factor. We saw a, you know, a surge of imports from, from Europe. And so I think you know, right now it's, it's worrisome how much inventory potentially is there. And that's also why I say that these record import numbers that some of these ports are still posting, it even is more concerning because if you're seeing these vessels off the coast of Savannah, of Los Angeles, Long Beach, and there's 20 to 25, most of those are nearly full right now as they arrive. And that's even more worrisome because that, those goods have to go somewhere. And right now, warehousing, the ports are pretty full. So it, it would say that there potentially is even more inventory than anyone's even aware of. I think what's really interesting in general is just kind of the response to this news coming out, right? At FreightWaves, I think that we're on top of the pulse. You know, we've got all of our sonar data, and we can kind of write to things as they come in. But it takes oftentimes the audience a little bit to get on that same page, right? We saw it with mm -hmm. Craig Fuller calling the freight recession back in March. Mm -hmm. Anthony, one of your starting 2022 market updates, you were like, we're going to see this glut of import demand by the time that the middle of the year arrives. Here we are, right? So we kind of call it like ahead of the curve. But with that, it takes people a little bit to get onto that curve as well. Do you think that there's kind of this fear almost for people accepting this kind of news and maybe not wanting to accept it because of what it means for the economic impact? Yeah, for logistics providers, it's been, it's been a boom. Um, you know, the, the surge in import demand has, you know, trickled into the truckload market. But, but you, you bring up a great point as to why the truckload market in this case may actually be an indication of what was to come for import demand. So this, this drop in import demand, not only was it really at unsustainable levels for the better part of 18, 24 months, um, but also you know, a, a reversion back to normal frequency or normal levels was expected. In the truckload market, you know, the volumes that dropped off, in my opinion, were the ones that were moving from DCs to the storefronts. And that would indicate, you know, that surplus of inventory. So inevitably, some of that truckload volume would dry up. Then you have to switch over to like 53-foot, you know, containers as a short-term storage method uh, for some of that volume as well. So all these factors culminating, you know, culminating at once led us to believe that this would ultimately go back overseas and say, you know, in the bullwhip effect, would say, okay, we need to start canceling orders. We need to slow down the amount of freight that's coming over because uh, we're sitting on too much. And Henry, one of the things that you just brought up is an excellent point: warehouse costs, that like. No pun intended, definitely through the roof. When we're looking at what's going on there, inventory levels definitely stacking up. When we're looking at producers, shippers, manufacturers, at least starting to get hit by you know all sides. When you're looking at um, you know inflationary pressures, then having to sell some of these goods at a heavily discounted rate. Mm -hmm. What does this do for some of those companies? When you look at okay, are these you know I think the latest 
job reports numbers at 10.4 million, or I'm sorry, 11.4 million. What does that look like um, for some of these companies? I think you're going to start to see a lot more layoff announcements. We've already seen them at some of the big tech firms. I think you're going to see you know, really larger numbers than anyone expects, honestly. I think there's just been, there's again, a, there's a number of factors all culminating at once. Uh, you have inflation, you have consumer demand destruction from inflation, but also from just the switch from discretionary spending to more of a you know, service-related service, service related goods um, as the reopening and everything happens. Um, so it's really all these factors at once, and I think that inevitably these companies are going to have to really cut a decent number of jobs in order to you know, cut costs. Last summer, we were sitting here talking about companies trying to play catch up with the inability to get goods, right? And then we were sitting here saying, you know, we run the risk of over ordering and now we're looking a year down the road and we were sitting exactly where we thought that we were going to sit this time last summer. Mm -hmm. And with that, a lot of what happens with the American consumer is they kind of move on from goods wants very, very quickly now, especially in this like hyper age of like the Amazon age, right? It's like always the new thing, always the hottest thing. And that can throw another wrench in companies' demand forecasting too, because what they think the consumer wants in six months isn't what the consumer wants by the time that it gets there, right? Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that effect maybe and how the changes in the American consumer really play into this as well? Yeah, you definitely have. I mean, just in time inventory management, things that, you know, with e the advent of e-commerce, it's, it's no surprise that you know, that those lead times were getting, you know, um, strained essentially. And I think that led to a lot of the service level, uh, these service levels from the ocean carriers, you know, getting worse and worse as you're, you know, we're at the worst we've been in 50 years as jewelry shipping consultants came out recently and said. And so, you know, you have this huge surge in demand, the inevitably con port congestion, the carrier services, transit times, they get longer. So those lead times for those manufacturers now are at levels that they, that are incorporated into their models that, that are no longer valid. And so they have late inventory arriving. Meanwhile, the consumer is getting crushed on the, you know, now that we're, we are where we are with inflation and everything like that. And so it's really, you know, again, just this culmination of factors. I'd say the real X factor is the geopolitical risk. When you look at the trade war, and you look at inventory buildups build related to that, and then the port strikes in 2014 and 2015, you had people bringing in inventory not just for consumer demand. It was more as a result of uh, them trying to mitigate risk that was you know, involved either through the port strikes or uh, the trade wars or you know, look at what's happening with the lockdowns. So it's no surprise that you know, importers are wanting to protect their business because if consumer demand surges again, they want to be ready. And, and you just mentioned the lockdowns. Can you talk to that briefly, talking to what the expectations were coming out of the lockdowns and what the reality is that you're seeing right now? Well, what we saw is that, you know, when the Port of Shanghai, um, it, that it, first of all, did not really um, close like the Port of Yanchen did in June of 2021. We were seeing volumes remain relatively consistent. Again, this is the value of this data that we have is because we're looking at it at origins. So we saw those volumes continue to flow. Project 44 was feeding us container dwell times. On the export side, we're at some of their lowest levels ever. On the import side, we're at some of their highest levels ever, saying that the imported goods into China were not getting you know, service through trucking capacity, and we're not able to make it to the factories. Um, and so when we looked at that, we said, okay, well, this surge in Shanghai is not really occurring now that we're reopened on June 1st. So we looked at Ningbo and did some analyzing there, and we saw that a lot of that freight was rerouted almost immediately through Ningbo, uh, which is the closest by port to Shanghai. If you look at these manufacturing centers outside of Shanghai, Hangzhou, places like that, they can very well service both of those ports. And so when you can't make a booking through Shanghai, you move it through Ningbo, and that's why lead times out of China in terms of the date of booking versus the date of the vessel's departure were at their lowest levels in history. Is there a solution to this incredible amount of inventory that companies are sitting on right now that maybe relies on the American consumer finding that extra cash or discretionary spending and saying, you know what, we're coming into the second half of the year, I'm gonna start my Christmas shopping now, spread it out over maybe six months to save a little bit of money, add a little bit of flexibility, or is it the point where the retailers are just gonna to have to cut their losses, discount it heavily merchandise, and just say, you know what, get it out? Well, I think a positive thing for some of these retailers is that some of these goods are um, goods that they can you know, hold on to. They're bigger ticket items, potentially, and maybe they can you know, sell through on discounts. And that even speaks positively, to potentially, for the truckload market and some of this you know, dis discounted goods getting to the store shelves and how that may help assist volumes there. But I think for like import demand, um, you know, it certainly it says even more about the, the potential drop that can occur because it's one of these things where if these, these items are not just seasonal, but can be sold through you know, peak season. What's peak season really gonna look like? And so that, that data um, that we have will certainly tell us exactly how that's playing out. But um, 
you guys love deals. I mean, I love a deal. My wife loves deals, of course. Um, so I think that consumers will rise to the occasion if the prices come down enough. And Henry, when we're looking at GDP, of course, is one of those areas that I, I just kind of always look at quarter to quarter to quarter. Not that it has a direct tie to freight and transportation, but one of the big things that happened in the last one was, of course, imports to exports. Any expectations moving forward into the second quarter? I think we're likely to see similar numbers. Um, you know, I think with the, the inevitably a drop in imports would, you know, would affect that in a similar way. I think, um, but I think, you, you know, as well as I do, that I think we're we're likely to see a technical recession at the next announcement. Um, I don't think that'll be much of a surprise. Um, but as far as you know, exporters, that import demand, you know, decreasing, the containers becoming more available, inevitably, and then the food shortage that's potentially, you know, on the horizon with what's going on in Ukraine. Um, you know, U.S. exporters may may benefit, um, and, and certainly container dwell times, container availability, and the ability to get on those ships with that, that demand decreasing will certainly uh, go up. So, I think uh, exporters tend, you know, tend to benefit in that type of environment. And Henry, last question before we let you go. Talking about where to get this data and where to see this, obviously our Sonar platform is that, but you provide these market updates, you write these articles. Where else can people go to kind of find the information about this? Yeah, well, Sonar Container Atlas, this is the whole premise behind it. This is exactly the moment in time that we built this uh, product for, is, is you know when you see these shifts in demand, uh, occur at origin that influences pricing in a very big way. So the metrics we have around demand, capacity, the amount of freight that's being rejected and indicating you know, extreme tightness in the market or extreme looseness of the market, um, lead times, everything of that nature. And the biggest thing is transit times. These manufacturers with the, the amount of time on the ocean, the amount of time those vessels are late to those destinations. Um, so Sonar's Container Atlas, I mean, if you don't have access to it, you're going to need it because, you know, right now, no one is really able to argue our point because no one has that data. Um, everybody's looking at data as it comes into the U.S., not at origin. And so, um, and I, I'll tell you that we're seeing confirmation some, for some, some of the largest global players that exist. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see in 30 days. Awesome. Well, Henry, thank you so much for joining us. It's always great having you, and it takes me back to our early days at Freight Waves. <laughs> we'll be definitely sure to follow up on any kind of stories developing from this. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, and we're going to toss it over to the wall right now. We've got Tony Mulvey here with Johnny Gilbert for our first carrier update of the morning.